All right, so let's go ahead and get started uh, so we can get through the agenda. Um, hopefully, here comes, here comes Kristen. I think we're just down. I saw Ren run that way. Oh, and Ren. I bet he's just getting water. Yeah. Um, call to order the meeting of the uh, Montpelier Roxbury Board of School Directors um, at 6 30 ish. Uh, 631. Um, uh, first order of business is public comment. Have any public comment? I want to go twice. Anyone on? Doesn't look like we have anyone on uh, Zoom. Okay. Um, on to the consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll approve the consent agenda with the additions of the um, co-curricular contracts and new hires. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Consent agenda passes. And now, already. 13 minutes out of schedule. Uh, um, pass it off to Nathan to talk about the MP, MRP, yeah, DRS visioning uh, committee report. And before you start, I just want to again thank everyone, including Sage and Rhett on this board. And Merrick. Uh, oh, and Merrick, too. Um, uh, and all the others who participated in this. I know it was a time commitment. Um, and and it would be sorry, Lori Davy. Um, because I participated in this because I know it was a lot of work and uh, excited to hear about the report and see what the next steps are. Uh, thank you for having me. It's good to see you all again. Uh, Libby, thank you for sharing your screen. So I, what I'd like to do, I, I actually haven't rehearsed this. So I don't know, maybe 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 this is 10 minutes. Let's see how it goes. Melissa, I'd like to open the floor and ask you all for questions, feedback, and thoughts. Uh, I'm going to open by saying that the report that I sent to you all a week ago is said it's a draft, it's intended as a draft, and that we are, as far as I'm concerned, sort of partway through this process and we're now bridging into the period where I work with the board and support you to take what we found as a visioning committee and then try to work that into the work you all are doing in terms of making policy, collaborating with the administration and then acting on or uh, if, if you see the need changing direction based on feedback from the community. So um, that's, my, that's my mindset at this moment. Uh, and we can talk about either tonight or in a sideline sometime soon about sort of what the next couple months of that looks like. Um, Libby, go ahead and advance. So the first slide is a is draft A of, a, of three vision statements that we as a committee came up with. Uh, I think this is the stronger of the three, but it's just a draft. Okay. Um, and it reads, our vision is that Montpelier Roxbury public schools are a learning community defined by connection, empathy, creativity, and choice as they pursue their passions in depth and where wellness, safety, and kindness connect with academic and social emotional support, accountability, and rigor to enable students to thrive and succeed in a changing world. Of course, as I read that out loud, I realized that when I changed learning uh, community of learners to learning community, I forgot to revise the rest of that sentence. So that's why there's a draft. Um, yes, I thought that was, that was great. And so I found a, a suitable graphic for Horizon staring. Uh, that, that could be an MRPS uh, senior right there. You never know. Um, Libby, will you give me the next slide? So I'm going to go a little bit backwards, and I'm sharing two, uh, three quotes that relate directly to the district facilities, because I think that this 
is an illustration of how we got to this, how you all got to this process in the first place. Um, on the left is a photograph of a postcard of the, the title of the postcard, which you probably can't read, says the new high school in Montpelier, Vermont. And it's a picture of what is currently the uh, Main Street Middle School. One of the quotes from the survey is a respondent who said, from everything I've heard, the merger with Roxbury is an ill-conceived idea and the facility in Roxbury for the elementary school is a dream on the Montpelier taxpayers. As far as I'm concerned, we should be re-examining a, po a possible merger with U32, as well as re-examining the Main Street Middle School. So that's one response from a community member. Uh, and there are a lot of sort of thoughts and ideas in that quote. Uh, next to that is a photograph of Roxbury Village School, and then two quotes from one of the community gatherings at Roxbury, where one of the participants said, we, Roxbury Village School, Village School, were disconnected when we had school choice. Now we are more connected, now being uh, post-merger in the new district. We're still early in the merger experience, and COVID is the X factor. Uh, our merger is new. The district is, is still a baby. And so I... I wanted to put those two, not necessarily in direct opposition to each other, but up beside each other, because I think that it's a, an example of the broad range of opinions and perceptions in the community around school facilities. And so in the first quote, um, it's, it opens with, I have heard from everything I have heard, which begs the question from whom and, and you know, who's this person talking with? Uh, and then, uh, the latter of the three quotes says the new district new district is still a baby, which I thought was kind of a wonderful conception of uh, time, right? How long might it take a new school district to find its feet and, and figure out its direction? Um, so let me give you the next slide. Um, the trouble with asking about a specific so facility like Roxbury Village School or Montpelier or Main Street Middle School, I think, is that it may be putting the cart before the horse. So if you go back to, if you start instead with the vision and you extend that into goals, strategy and action, which may include communication, uh, then go ahead. Uh, if we take one of the, one of, two of the sort of visionary statements about what we think Montpelier Roxbury graduates should stand for, uh, that is to think and reason well, and also to uh, exhibit teamwork and collaboration. Then, how does the district work towards this vision? Go ahead. So, one response, of course, is programming, which in this case is education writ large. And the reason I wrote it as programming is that when you're talking about buildings, if you're talking to an architect, an architect will say, you need to understand the programming before you design the building. Go ahead. Um, within programming, that would include pedagogy. Uh, how does the Rock Montpelier Roxbury School go about education? Go ahead. Content, what's, what's the content of the curriculum? Go ahead. Who are the educators? Uh, what are the values that guide the decision-making in the district? Go ahead. What's the capacity of the district? And by this, I mean, uh, personnel, funding, and facilities and other resources. So if we pause here for just a second, actually give me two more clicks. So if you're sort of thinking from the top and talking about vision and then how does a district deliver on vision and some of the major factors that feed into that, it's only further down when you get to talking about facilities and other resources and what the programming that you all want to do calls for in terms of facilities. So you know, obviously we have the facilities we have, uh, so those those don't change quickly, but I think that part of the reason that it's part of the, the motive for this whole process is to move away from being uh, in a reacting, a reactive position where, you know, you're hearing concerns or, or interests from the community and responding one at a time to a more global vision for what should this district stand for. And then that leads to a cascade of, uh, decisions and actions. Go ahead, Libby. Uh, further on down, if, if you're constructing this this way, would these decisions would be influenced by pragmatism? What can the district achieve quickly? What about systemic change? Um, 
is this particular goal in tension with other goals? And then placing those things on a timeline and figuring out how to monitor. Uh, so when will the actions above take place and how will I know if we are on track? Uh, so anyway, I, I wanted to I wanted to use the facilities uh, discussion as a lever to to remind us all why we're here, why we've engaged in this visioning process. Uh, go ahead. Okay, so another piece of this, though it wasn't in the title of the of the project, was to explore the district values. Go ahead. So in this case, uh, in terms of sort of popularity in the survey, transparency was the most popular value. Well, what does transparency mean? Go ahead. So it may mean, you know, how did my student get placed in this class rather than that one, right? Does a parent have some visibility on how those decisions are made? What is the district's process for assessing learning differences? My student was mistreated by a teacher. Were they held accountable? And if so, how? And then from an educator, the district just adopted a new tool for literacy, but I wasn't consulted on this decision or aware of the process. So these are just examples, and these aren't uh, these aren't actually taken from community feedback, but they're examples that I'm I've heard in the community. Um, go ahead and click to the next slide. So as we work through this, sort of in the next stage of the pro this project, we'll develop elaborate value or, and elaborate values on values and how the district will express these values. So an example is if you if we take transparency and then we try to articulate how the district might express that value, uh, this could be for all time, this could be for a year. Uh, the district anticipates questions from caregivers, communicates how our decisions are made and what motivates those decisions. The district acknowledges that we have to make trade-offs to govern our schools. We pledge to show our work so that the community sees why. Uh, to protect privacy, we can't always discuss our responses to incidents in the schools, but we'll tell you what we can. So those are, again, these are, this is me drafting what each, uh, as we flesh out each value, what that might look like. And that's something that, you know, I can draft those things and you can react to them, but I think that there's some balance between me doing that and the board having input um, and trying to take from feedback from the community that we do have in hand about what the community means by transparency or by respect. Go ahead. Um, here's another example, as I was thinking about transparency, which to me includes communication a lot of the time. Uh, I think sometimes, and, and this came up in our outreach, that the perception is that you know, the district teachers, education leaders, and the, the concepts in education speak are sort of one body of knowledge. And then the caregiver, student experience, expectations, and their knowledge of education practice are another, and that there's not a, there's not a whole lot of shared understanding between those things. And that's, that's too strong a statement, but, it, but just to explain the illustration, I think in fact, the, the Venn diagram in the upper right which includes a lot of overlap uh, and the middle zone says common goals and shared understanding, I think is actually more common. And I think that communication is a key piece of that as well as getting feedback from the community on a regular basis. And I think that the, uh, I don't know if this is a universally, certainly not universal. I don't know if it's a widely held perception, but certainly one of the things we heard in the feedback from educators in the district was that during COVID, which we're still in, um, the, you know, one teacher expressed great appreciation for how clearly Libby was Libby and the district were communicating about those conditions changing over time and, and what was happening within the district. Um, that's not always clear, right? So uh, one of the things that I recognized in this process was that there may be space for education in the community with regard to terminology around education. So an example is um, sort of equity versus equality, or another example is social, emotional, and behavioral learning, uh, SEBL. And as early in the committee, when we were defining the scope of inquiry, the social, emotional learning, that, that concept came up 
and there was a little bit of discussion about, well, will people know what that means? And, you know, so maybe we don't use that terminology. And then other members of the committee pointed out, you know, within the world of education, there's been a long battle, a long fight to bring social emotional learning to the forefront and make that an important component. So, you know, I don't want to give up that ground by, by not using that terminology. And so that, that, those are a couple of examples where I think that um, even greater communication and, and greater education of the stakeholders in the district may help the district do its work and um, do so transparently. Um, and then more on communication, uh, because the district does do a lot of communicating and because most folks can't necessarily read everything, Uh, the district may choose, for example, a, a sort of a level of message discipline, uh, and this might include lead administrators and, and the school board, uh, to choose five, the five most important goals for the school year and return to those goals frequently. And again, I've just ghostwritten this. This is a, a model, not necessarily goals that the district has decided upon. But you might say that for 2022-2023, we're focused on transparency, by which we mean better timely communication with families, inclusion, ensuring that student voice is part of culture setting discussions, and then empathy uh, and that perspective taking is a district wide learning goal for this year. So those are those are three examples, you know, you may choose in a, in a uh, priority setting or goal setting session to name the board's five top priorities that you're asking the district to, to work on and practice those and that those become part of your script as communicators, you know, because especially the school board, you're the bridge between the community and the district. Um, and then more broadly, uh, and I was in a conversation with Jim where we were talking about the way that I presented some of the information in this report, which includes uh, noting which, for example, which values ga gained the most support from community members. Transparency was first, respect was second, empathy and kindness was third, collaboration, inclusion, and equity. But since all of those had a decent amount of support, it may be more useful to think of them instead of a ranked list, but rather a, a, sh a, pool, a shared pool or a constellation of values. And I think that, that uh, maybe that's obvious, but I think that some simple um, tweaks to how the district talks about values or talks about vision may be really helpful so that folks don't feel as though there's a pecking order, but rather we're working, you're working towards a, a collective set of values. Go ahead. Okay, so then uh, I think one of the puzzles for school boards is often what might the board do with the information you've just gotten and as you resolve to work hard on a certain vision point or certain values. Um, one of the things that came up a lot during the community engagement was were, were issues around school culture. So if the if for this year the board were decide to decide that positive school cu culture is a priority, uh, that might become expressed. Carry on. Uh, sorry, this is small to the folks in the audience. Um, the board might identify some elements of the district culture that merit change. Those could include that a lot of people report that in the high school, it seems that uh, college admission is the main goal and there's a culture around that. But many people wish that there were sort of a, a many, uh, many options on the menu as opposed to uh, the college is the goal. Go ahead. Uh, to build greater trust and respect among staff and administration. Uh, and that students feel seen, respected, and safe. So let's say that the board identified that those, those were goals of the board. Go ahead. So then I think the board might seek input from education leaders, i.e. Libby, Mike Berry, et al. Uh, what do the board and administration think are the key factors to achieve positive culture? And then the board would collaborate with the administration to identify these key factors and a uh, district theory of change. And by which I mean, um, if key factors include, we clicked a little bit ahead, uh, 
if, you know, there you go, if key factors include uh, recruiting and retaining great teachers and having long duration building leaders, I'm again, just spitballing here, then, and, and that the board and the administration agree that those are key factors, then uh, the administration would respond with perhaps proposals about how to go about this, including recruiting and retaining, uh, details on the strategy, and then how they might execute on that. Go ahead. And then the board would discuss, decide, and respond to those proposals with resources, communication, and feedback. And then the highlighted part in blue is, you know, that's the, that's the administration role, right? Um, there might be broad agreement that recruiting and retaining great teachers is a way to achieve this goal of positive co school culture. But even that, even the sort of how to achieve that goal starts to get into the administration role rather than the board role. And so the, I think that part of what's interesting after a process like this is working either you yourselves or working with me, thinking about how the school board can build and write policy around this and interact with the administration that uses the board's role effectively and gets movement within the district towards these goals that are shared. Was that helpful? Okay, go ahead, Libby. Uh, so again, from my, uh, this is open discussion as far as I'm concerned about what's next, go ahead. I think that what's next is that uh, we refine the vision and values to be powerful tools for the board, administration, educators, caregivers, and students. Uh, I will support the board in setting priorities if that's something that, if that's a role you'd like me to help play. Uh, help translate the vision and values into policy language. Identify decision points raised by the visioning process and support the board to take positions in these areas. And so this, this would lead, could lead to a lot of discussion. For example, um, it's clear that behavior and accountability in, the, in schools is a major topic and there are a really wide range of public positions or thoughts about how the school district should handle accountability. And so there's no way, at least in my mind, that the school board or the administration can um, respond to those challenges in a way that keeps everybody in the community happy. And so you all have some decisions to make. And um, that's just one example, but it may actually be useful to decide, yep, we've heard that a lot of folks in the community think this about behavior. That's not how we're going to respond. We are choosing to respond in a different way or approach uh, school behavior and student accountability differently. And I think if the school board can make some of those decisions, again, in collaboration with the administration, um, that probably has a, a liberating or freeing effect in that it allows you to answer incoming questions from the community. It allows the administration to work more freely with more clarity Etc. Um, the next point is to is the question of sharing granular information with the district. So, this community engagement process pulled in lots and lots and lots of feedback on things that are not strictly vision or values. Right? What you should teach in the curriculum, how you should go about teaching the curriculum. You know, more outdoor education, etc. Uh, and so, there's a lot of information that that I have and the committee has, and I would love to talk together about how you'd like me to turn that over to you or make that visible and legible. Uh, but I think, it's, I think it's good information for the board to have, although it doesn't directly relate in most cases to this process. Um, refine the report, and then the, there should be some sort of public presentation that is could be at a school board meeting, but should be, I think, uh, publicized and warned and um, where there's an opportunity for the community to see that the input that they gave is having an impact and and how that's being used by the district. Uh, I think one more slide. Keep going. Um, so I, I want to I probably took well more than 10 minutes, of course. Um, you know, my questions for you include uh, were there surprises for the board or the administration from what you've seen so far? Uh, do you see calls for a significant change in direction? Uh, how will the board show the community that this process is influencing change? 
Um, and I think we should all be mindful of who are the audiences for this work and how we communicate with them. And then what questions do you all have? Thank you. And it was 10 minutes from the time you were supposed to start. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it counts for something. Um, yeah, thank you, that was super helpful and, and a great overview. Um, love to open up with the board and maybe prior to you know, Merrick, Seiji, Rhett, who were part of the process, if they want to give any kind of you know, perspectives or well, fill in any blanks. Um, so if I may. Yeah, please do. Um, there, so there were a lot of questions that, um, you know, we were trying to communicate with people and get feedback from people in a variety of ways. <clears throat> Some of those ways included specific questions with specific multiple choice answers. They often then gave the opportunity for people to sort of ad lib. And I and um, what I understand happened because I, I did play a part in it a little bit. Nathan ended up transcribing all of those individual statements that were sort of broad ranging. Some of them were you know, very sort of applicable to vision and values. Some of them were more sort of specific um, to maybe an individual family's specific experience. Um, but would you mind sharing just sort of like how, how much data you transcribed and sort of the process for figuring out what, where that, where all of those sort of, those extra answers that were sort of they were sort of just people writing a couple sentences about their thoughts about things and how that data ended up sort of informing the report or how you, you chose to, to manage that. Because sure. it was a pretty big task. Uh, so first, it's important to say that I had helped, uh, Red helped, Seiji helped, uh, a number of other folks did some data entry that included um, uh, Joe, you know, taking written responses and inputting them into the survey instrument so that they would show up within the survey data. Um, but in terms of free answer, both within the survey and in public engagement or notes taken on poster paper and things like that, I think we're at 2,900 lines of, of responses, uh, you know, some of which are, are a few words and some of which are, are paragraphs. And then as a committee, what we tried to identify what are we seeing in the text? What are we seeing in these responses? And are there category, are there broad categories to which these apply? So, um, you know, some of it is as specific as curriculum, right? What's, uh, or rather uh, content, academic content. Some of it's about academic pedagogy. Some of it was about vision. Some of it was about values. Some of it was an expression of the experience of school culture uh, or desires for a different school culture. Some of it was about extracurricular activities. Um, so it was about leadership. So we had, uh, I think, 17 or 18 essentially codes or categories. And so uh, what I did was go through each of the each each statement and essentially try and code each one. This statement relates to um, values as well as school culture. Uh, this statement relates to pedagogy as well as, you know, extracurricular activity. And so then what that allows me to do is go through all of it and um, essentially sort for Okay, what what are the state what are the statements or inputs that relate to uh, vision? Go through those and then look to make sure that what we've gotten from the survey is either supported by the free answer responses, right? So in the survey, folks were primed with a menu and you could choose from that menu. And that has a certain effect on responses. So what what happens when people respond freely without that priming? And does it is that aligned with what folks are saying in the survey? So that's one, that's, that's one example. Um, one of the things I liked about it, uh, and I, I hope that some of the committee folks had looked through, because the committee had, had access to a lot of this during the process, um, it gave me a, a real sense of the texture of the responses and allowed me for the report and for, for example, this presentation to pull out particularly juicy comments that really describe the range of positions that people have in the district. Um, it doesn't necessarily make your jobs easier, right? Partly because we have a diverse uh, population in terms of opinions. And so um, just describing the landscape isn't everything. And that's why I think some of the next steps are to 
identify, okay, accountability within the classroom is a theme. What position do you want the district to take on that? Sure. Um, well, so I was just kind of wondering, you said there were 2,900 responses approximately. Where do you think there were the biggest, uh, I would say, discrepancies and areas in this um, process or throughout this process? Sure. Uh, so first I'll talk about values for a quick second. One of the things we did was try to identify uh, specific demographics and see whether or not specific demographics were different in terms of their responses from the general survey responses. So in the case of values, um, and again, it may not be super useful to rank values in terms of popularity. However, transparency and respect were both just north of 50% in terms of the general responses, but among residents of Roxbury, um, respect was 69% and transparency only 44%. And then in folks with non-college background, so one of the things we identified early on was we had a lot of respondents who have uh, bachelor's degrees or uh, master's degrees or above. And we thought, well, that may not be totally representative of our population, so let's make sure that we're, we're hearing from folks who don't have a college degree. Um, folks with a non-college background, uh, again, noting that respect is, you know, 66% of folks with non-college background ranked respect is the most important value and transparency much lower at 38 percent so that's an example that i think is sort of i don't i can't pretend that there's an explanation within the qualitative data that says why but it's interesting to see um and then in that report i called out uh emerging themes you just asked about sort of the most, what, you, what was the word used? Well, so like discrepancies, discrepancies the biggest yeah. areas perhaps where we didn't get enough information. Oh, okay. So those are different. To me, the biggest discrepancies yeah. uh, or disagreement are around things like student behavior and accountability. Um, let's see, <coughs> around... Uh, for example, basic needs. So one of the things we were asking about was, you know, what are, um, what do students need to succeed in school? And that gets into, you know, nutrition, um, stability at home, access to, to services and things like that. And there's a pretty wide range of opinions about whether or not those things should happen within school or, be facilitated by school, or it's really not the school's job, et cetera. Um, so those are two examples. Uh, in terms of where we did not get enough feedback, mm -hmm. I think that's probably what I just said is the, is the best example in, uh, give me a second. So, in response to the question, um, areas for which I think schools should provide support or teaching, and the options were um, understanding their emotions and those of others, mental health, diversity, equity, and inclusion, sexual health, and peaceful community-based ways to resolve conflict and repair harm, aka restorative justice. Um, and there was almost no daylight between responses. Mm -hmm. So that, that was a category, either, either we didn't design the survey well enough or there's just you know, no obvious, these are the things that are most important. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, just open it up generally to um, questions and thoughts on next steps. Uh, I think you laid out kind of the options and quite well in terms of yeah, the board kind of giving thought to you know, how do we synthesize this and, and where do we take it. Um, and uh, speaking for myself, um, you know, still are under contract. We I think we'd love your help and guidance and you know 
um, synthesizing this down as well. We'll discuss that in more detail. So, um, John. John. Just a comment on how much I felt like I learned from reading the details, right? So we're looking at a very high level sort of response reflection here, but um, I really felt like those voices were like leaping off the page. And I admit, I certainly have my own like confirmation biases I was probably looking for. But what I was struck by is I, it was very clear that you folks had heard from people that we do not hear from. And I was learning things that I did not know or was not did not have that lens. I can honestly say that there were things I, I learned from those results. And I'm really, really grateful to the people who just, you know, to Red's point, just sort of let it there because their voices were really clear. And I, I feel like I know our community better because of it. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. That was the motion that second because uh, basically like I, I was talking to Nathan and I said I think the whole school board would benefit from reading the feedback, just transcribing everything was, you know, not to read all reading all of it, you don't have to, but I think just reading the the, the straight feedback from all the people was, was really good and really insightful. Okay. Are there any um, groups of people or in the community that you felt you wanted to reach out and couldn't, or did you get enough representation across the board? I think in terms of uh, BIPOC respondents, <clears throat> so folks of color, we did hear from you know probably 55 respondents within the survey, but some of those were one-offs, right? Please respond to this one prompt and then identify your, your demographic information and rather than you know somebody filling out the whole survey comprehensively and so that means that in terms of drawing conclusions you know i gave the example to merrick about values and different opinions about what values are most important when you look at just roxbury residents or just non-college background we don't have enough numbers to draw that kind of conclusion for bipoc folks um, i did use thanks to amanda who shared uh, the esser um, the ESSER affinity groups responses when, when folks were discussing ESSER funding. And a lot of that did relate to this process, um, but it didn't, it wasn't appropriate to put that through the survey instrument. And so those are in the free answer responses. Um, yeah. We also, there was a, bu a bunch of discussion about how to make sure we were aware of the needs of or experiences of neurodivergent students or maybe parents of those students. And we may have heard, uh, we may have heard from uh, folks sort of representing that experience, but we didn't, um, in the survey, I didn't have a way to identify that within the demographic queries. And we didn't, um, we were trying to figure out if we could sort of figure that out within when we were doing student outreach and we concluded that that wasn't within the within the, the sort of values of professional practices of the district uh to identify those folks and say okay you know um you are the, the neurodivergent group or neurodiverse group um and we want to hear from you so um i don't know if that I think there's a lot there's a lot of feedback about what kind of support students need and how that might you know how that might be best delivered or or you know some complaints about not getting services that folks want so i think that it's in there um it's just not as easily carved out and identified as some of the others i guess um i'm gonna be able to phrase this right but did you get a sense that there are definitely MRPS have two different communities? We, the exercise, at least to some degree, was is there a shared vision you know, going forward? Um, did you get a sense that there is a shared vision among the communities? And, um, I think definitely. And I think you know, part of my question to you all is, um, are there, were there surprises to you from within you know, what you're seeing here? Hold on a second. Um, I, you know, especially in terms of vision and people wishing to see, um, you know, 
critical critical thinking. Uh, hang on. Uh, you know, the ability to think and reason well, kindness and caring for others, or empathy, uh, teamwork and collaboration, and engagement with community service with the community and service to others, respect and dig dignity and creativity. There's just a lot of agreement that those are very important outcomes. Um, granted, some of those have gotten more responses than others. Uh, that seems to be, there's a lot of agreement. And, and I think that the devil's in the details in terms of, and that's why I called out culture, both in this report and in the presentation a little bit this evening. Um, it's clear that there, there are some questions around school culture or even administration staff culture, things like that. That wasn't, we didn't identify that specifically within the vision, you know, as a sort of menu item, but the number of free answer responses that addressed culture in one way or another were tremendous. And so, and that's, a, it's not to say that it's, it's a, it's a crisis or it's all in jeopardy, just that that's a theme to pay attention to. And I think within that theme, there are questions, right? What's, what's the approach to delivering education? What's the approach to delivering on basic needs for students? What's the approach to, um, student accountability or, um, you know, behavior, things like that. So I think it's, it's those areas where, um, there's less unity. And I think that that's a, it's an example where, uh, this is moving from facilitator to consultant role a little bit, you know, I think the school board needs to decide this is, this is, this is how we want to approach this. And we've heard these, these other, opinions that are different from what the board is deciding and we're aware this is why we're deciding this way and i think that's what's difficult about your role other questions Brett? so this effort followed a lot of work on the part of the board to communicate uh the community's desires regarding the budget and then ESSER 2 and ESSER 3. Is that mm -hmm. right? Is that, yes. So we, we're doing a lot of outreach to sort of figure out um, what people wanted. This followed all of those efforts. And I think that, you know, we experienced a little bit of weariness because we were reaching out. We were just saying, like, tell us what you, what you want. Tell us what you want. Um, and there was a pandemic, um, which I think it's important to remember is the context for this entire effort. Um, so if you were going to do this again in five years, what would you do differently? So it's a, it's a great question. I think that things that went really well were engagement with pre-assembled groups, right? So whether it's meeting with students in the context of their classroom, where the classroom teacher has given, the, given that room over to us to do that outreach, um, meeting with the faculty at the middle school or the faculty at the elementary schools, um, where they've given the staff time over to, to work with us. Um, I think that that said, the community engagement that we did do you know, community gatherings at Roxbury Village School, Union Elementary School, those weren't too terrifically well attended. Um, however, those are the areas, those are the conversations where if we're talking about um, sort of how education is delivered in the district, there's a chance to ask follow-up questions and say, well, what do you, you know, what if it were your student who were struggling with behavior, how would you like the school to respond to that? You know, when, when, a, when a parent is saying, my student is struggling to learn because of the behavior issues in the classroom. And so then you get to the next layer and the next layer of, of values. And I think people grapple then with the complexity of it. And I would love to, to make that more successful. Um, you know, I think Jim said in a, uh, in a press article that, you know, in his experience, the community shows up when they're upset or something to that effect. So, you know, I think that you're right. It was, we're in a pandemic, there is some fatigue. Um, I do wish we'd had better participation and if we could inspire that next time, it'd be terrific. However, I don't, if, if, 
if that necessitates being in a crisis, I wouldn't wish for that. Yeah, one, one comment I'd love to make is um, kind of in terms of structuring some next steps. I and mean, one thing that, you know, the Montpelier board had before the merger was four clear ends that really, I think, reducted values. I mean, they're, they exist somewhere in the ether. I think Libby chased them down at one point, and I think I could easily find them. Yeah, you know, their ends into that when I read them, they're they're out of date. I think they were probably crafted 10, 15 years ago, and um, I don't think reflect where the district wants now. But I mean, I kind of see in this the beginning of some maybe new ends for this district. And, and one of the real advantages of having something like ends is it's you know it's a point on the horizon that the board and the administration can point to when we guide our work and when we kind of think about how we want to get there and what the roles are to get there. But having having those kind of clear value-based ends uh, is very important. And I, I think this document has, you know, the, the uh, to that. yeah, it, it's got the materials to, to put those together if that's a direction we choose to go. Amanda? I want to just thank you and for the members of the committee that are in here um, for all this work. I think it's great. Um, I always see this as a continuation of something that has been happening around, like the school safety committee and all the feedback that also got uh, here, plus the affinity spaces all coming together. Um, and it didn't, you know, I was not surprised that equity was not the number one uh, thing in the thing in, in the in the report um, because we didn't have a lot of the feedback. I think like for the BIPOC community that I am often in contact with, they were so exhausted by the end, you know, after the affinity space, after like asking and asking. That they were just like one part. I was exhausted. I was like, I don't want to talk about this anymore. But uh, so I think like that had a lot to do with it. But I think there's like so much beauty also in just the comments and the perceptions that people have, and like what you came up with as like the steps forward. I see this process as not a product on its end, but as a process that can continue to grow with all the feedback, with the new staff, new administration team, I think that, you know, we can get there and, and not having this be like the, the it, but like the, you know, the, the pieces of the process that we can continue to grow. And I think there's a lot to work on that can last for, you know, a long time and, and not get lost in like, this is what the community say now, because we were in a pandemic, because of the context that we were in and I lose sight of other things that might be priorities too. So this, but when I was reading this, I was like, seeing. so it didn't really strike me that equity was num not number one, but I understood the context that we were in. And it, just to respond to that specific point, I think that I, I said a little bit earlier, but it, it struck me during this process that there are some sort of concepts that aren't um, that are discussed in the in the sort of school board or or education leaders circles, and and where those folks have their hands fully on them, and I think that maybe in the community it's it's new language, new territory, and well, what does that really mean? And so I think there's a there's a there's a role for sort of ongoing collective education. Here's what we mean. Here's why we're doing this. This is what we mean by social emotional learning, etc. Yeah. The end of the jargon. <laughs> I also just want to express my profound appreciation to all of you who served on the committee. I know that it was very time consuming and that the uh, timeline extended beyond what we had originally asked from you. So, um, you know, and, and, and seeing 2,900 plus responses is no small feat. So I think that's a huge number of responses and it definitely um, gave us a mix of sort of quantitative and qualitative data that is great to, to dig into and I think will eventually help us help guide our work. Um, I really look forward to sort of like the public presentation when you outlined sort of next steps, those aligned with my thinking as well. And um, I really look forward to engaging the public with 
these findings and the process and hearing from um, more members of the committee and their experience. So thank you all. Party. A risk of being redundant, I, I second all of that. And I do think this like sets a precedent for us. You know, I think there's, I think about when I first joined the board and there was a lot of talk about how, you know, yeah, we just weren't getting much community engagement and it just feels like we're crawling, like we're getting there. And this was like a big step in that. It gave us board members an opportunity to really show up in our communities and, and talk with people informally and have like real talk, have, have some real straight talk with people. And I think that was really helpful in terms of like establishing relationships um, with the people of our communities. And I think that our board has, um, you know, a, a deep commitment to really engaging the public and has really um, taken that charge to heart as like a core function of, of a school board. And so now that we have this as sort of touch points, you know, we, we have something to kind of come back to and refer to and continue and deepen these conversations with community members. So I'm really grateful for just like its its value in, in supporting that. Um, and just, again, like a huge undertaking and thank you to everybody who's who's been involved. Um, other question or comments? Otherwise, I think we'll maybe go back to the slide about next steps and we can kind of just do a check in and see if that's if that aligns with what the board is thinking. And if so, we can go with it. And if we've got some amendments, we can give you some guidance on that. Um, uh, one, one behind that, one above that. There you go. So I'll just, I'll read again. We'll find the vision and values to be powerful tools for the board, administration, educators, caregivers, and students. Um, and it, it's worth explaining why I listed those stakeholders. But if, if the district adopts a set of values, they're powerful for the school board, they're also powerful for the administration, and they should be powerful for uh, caregivers, parents, and even students who are advocating for themselves and for uh, you know, their own interests. Um, my role as a consultant, uh, supporting the board in setting priorities, uh, sometimes it's just helpful to sort of carve out time to do that and for me to come up with a structure by which you work through some of these thorny issues. Um, help translate the vision and values into policy language. Uh, the board already does that, I think, quite well in a lot of ways, um, but it, you know, if that's, a, if that's a, a help, I'm here for that. Um, and then identify the decision points raised by the visioning process and support the board in taking positions in these areas. And you know, I'll come back to the basic needs question, for example, you know, should, should the district be a locus, be a, a, uh, a node for, by, through which students and maybe even families can access services of various types? You know, there's a quote by one parent who talks about uh, their, their uh, apprehension about supporting their child in their homework when the child's work becomes more complex, more complex than the parent feels prepared to support. And, you know, the parent said, you know, essentially teach me to read, which is not entirely accurate because this person's capable of reading, but um, it struck me that, you know, the, the school district's role could be very expansive if you chose to, to name it as such, right? How do we support parents to be great parents in the context of educating their kids? Um, obviously, I'm naming, I'm naming sort of a far out point on a spectrum, but, but it's worth saying that's a thing and, and you all can decide what position the district wants to take. Um, sharing the granular information with the district, um, you know, one way to do this is to simply share in a, you know, a Word document responses to various prompts and, and let you read through them. And it's really, um, it, it gives me goosebumps. So I think, I think you would find it rewarding, even if it's not organized any further than that. But we can, <laughs> we can figure that out. Um, you know, this report is a draft and it's, it's one of these Goldilocks things, right? How much is too much? It's 30 some pages long, but there's a lot of graphics. So maybe it went quickly or maybe that's not distilled enough. Let me know. Uh, and then the public presentation, which I think we should collaborate on, you know, what the design of that is and, and how best to 
it doesn't necessarily have to be one thing party at Amanda's house, but you know, I'm I'm open to that. I mean, I like all these. The one thing I think should be folded in there is you know, helping to craft and um, and kind of maybe giving us some starting places on that. I think that folds in well with point one. Yeah. Oh, that's what I was just going to say. Is I imagine that that's the result of yeah. point one, and I would welcome Nathan's support to help the board in doing that. Um, I think we could benefit from your facilitation and your um, just um, understanding of and familiarity with all of this subject matter and data, um, given what you've done so far. I think that that would be um, really useful to have your facilitation. And I would agree that I think that that's, that having some, that articulation of maybe we call it ends is, is point one. And then that's, and then I think what we do is we set priorities by looking at the ends, what we've just articulated and say, are we there yet? No, how far, how much do we need to do to get there? Okay, what should we do this year or the next two years? That's how I see the first two points happening. Hi, backtrack. Just one question that I have Nathan, for you is, the the vision and statements that you all wrote. What part do you think is just the survey instrument and the community engagement that you did? And what part did there is there some influence around the other things that were shared with you, like the safety policy committee, like the focus groups that were small? So some of the other things that you did. Uh, was there any of that influence in there or was this just the instrument? I love this question. <laughs> Thank you. So the uh, well, we do want to go back to the second slide that has the vision that the sort of a vision statement. Um, we discussed probably just the form within the committee. You know, I, honestly, I was advocating for a vision uh, vision statement that might have been a page or a page and a half long, right? With a with a number of components that are named, and the committee was really saying. Um, and not just here no let's let's make it shorter more digestible and that's fine and so this is this is the distillation of that impulse um let's try to get and, and it was influenced by um lots of the you know by the time we were drafting this we had a lot of information in and, and we'd seen a bunch of it and we'd shared and discussed a bunch of it um it's if you look at the mass of the information and you look at this it's of course inadequate right it's it's a product of many choices of which words to use and how to use them and what are we pointing to. Um, part of what I like about this was that there was an impulse on the committee to really, you know, let's have the language be be pushy, you know, push, let's push the board, let's push the district for change. That's what we're hearing. Let's make sure that that energy is present. Um, so, so I think it it is made from all the ingredients. I think the question, you know, for me, if I'm in your seat and we're describing what Jim is calling ends, does each of one of those have sort of two sort of power, powerful lines and then a paragraph that says, here's what we mean? Uh, you know, I, I think to me that's important is, uh, and that's why, you know, I, I illustrated the transparency example. Right? What do we mean by transparency? Well, here's what we heard. So as a district, here's what we mean when we see transparency, and here's what we're going to hold ourselves to. Um, so I think that's the area where we would see more, it'd be more visible, uh, some of the broader range of input. Does that help? Mm -hmm. No. No. Sorry, there's a little delay. Oh, I just got kicked off a Zoom. That's all. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> Hold on. So let me ask a question while we're getting this back up. Um, I know that. Uh, August was a, you know, 
in terms of the board meeting and you, I think you were going to have a retreat on the 16th and have either just def not de not done it or deferred that, but we're it's that, for an alternative day. Yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know how you want to use that time and I don't want to uh, sort of show them where, where this process is welcome, but, but it could be that we spend some of the time you, you plan to spend on generating these things and, and um, you know, in my experience, that can be really efficient if I do some drafting and you have some raw material to respond to because you definitely, you're very good at telling, I don't like that. And I, I really, this really does resonate. And so I think that that, you know, those are, that's potentially a way forward for some of this stuff. Yeah, I think having some stuff to respond to would be very helpful. I mean, we have not, we have not laid out a date for a retreat, nor have we uh, and <clears throat> set the agenda. And I know that we want to talk about um, hazy harassment and bullying. So I think we'll, we want to also make sure there's time for this discussion. So it, it's, it's definitely a possibility that we could carve out some or some of that time for um, and I think for this or do it at another meeting or have a special meeting as well. Too. And I don't want, I don't want to overstep my role, but I think that the question to uh, point number three, how will the board show the community that this process is influencing change? It may be that if we make enough progress in the next month and a half, that the products of this influence the budget, which is, in my experience, one of the most concrete expressions of values mm -hmm. in a district. And so it might be helpful for you all to be able to say, we've said this, we've asked the administration for their wish list and how, how to pursue these things. They've given it to us, we're responding in this way. You know, I don't know, but that's a... Yeah, yeah. And, and I think one value of this, and then I'll go to that, of, of putting some ends right now, and I've, I've said this before, is you know our financial picture given student decline, uh, student number decline, and the effect of the waiting study, which I think we all support, but it does have real consequences for the district, may mean that in the next budget cycle, we may need something to guide some choices um, in, in ways that, that we have not had to make in a while. Amanda. I'm getting nervous and this conversation happened because I, you know, like, I think part of this work is like that work plan and that future vision that this plan is for this one year. And that I think that, you know, that there's already plans on their way that the administration is done. So like, it's mixing all of those things in one. That is, this is why I always say it's not the end product because we have to take into consideration all the pieces. So this is great and like i think like what we have to do as a board is look at okay what are the challenges that people are experiencing that are telling us that, that we want the district to change some of that is already happening uh in one way or another so it's again expressing that like telling people this is what we're already doing and this is not we're not going to solve everything in one year we're not going to solve you know things that we have inherited from decades ago, these priorities that we have, and we're not gonna be able to fix it with this and not put it in the budget. So like, we really have to be honest with ourselves and with our community that this is a work that we're gonna have to do. There are some things that we can do this year and that there are some priorities that we have to choose for the budget, even if we get caught in some of the things, but you know, can we access other money? So like, I think we just, we should like think this through a holistic approach of all the things that already happen and how they connect um, and how they connect with the work that is already happening and how it's connecting to the future vision of the work that needs to happen, right? Like, I think there are pieces that, so I just, you know, we can't solve it in a year, but we, there are things, pieces that we can do this year, you know, so. Uh, I, I wonder if it's in our best interest to sort of put together a cyclical approach to this whole process where every five years or so this or some number of years or something, there's some kind of re revisitation because we do need to figure out goals for this year. We do want to figure out five years, goal, five years from now goals potentially. I don't know if I'm comfortable setting goals further than that because the world changes and everybody changes. And I don't know if that's appropriate. Um, so I wonder if part of our process becomes putting together a, a process that 
cyclically revisits these questions so that we can have a, a good set of goals for this year, maybe a good set of goals for some short, you know, medium term, and then start the process again. Um, I, I feel like that would be responsible um, and potentially set a precedent for future boards. Um, and I would add to that an evaluation process that needs to happen every year. Like, how do we do? How do we get to that goal? And like, what? And then that's how you reassess whether or not you're gonna have to do this over again in five years. If you are evaluated, like you need to evaluate to be able to see where you are at. And so put in not only the cycle, but add in measurements, you know, the what you need to evaluate and what the data that you need, and then yeah, I mean, different decisions need different time. I mean, for instance, there was some some mumblings about the adequacy of facilities, BDPs. Well, if we're going to make a major facilities investment, we're going to want to do it on like maybe a 20, 30 year horizon because you know, if we were say, to build a new building, um, we would want that building to, to meet needs for a long time and then there's other things where you, you do have the ability to reassess every six months every nine months per year um other thoughts for nathan does it sound like having him back and having him kind of come in with some some things for us to chew on at a slightly uh higher level of of detail or at least drafting would be useful and Olivia and i can find some time to do that it might be the retreat it might be a future meeting, if we need to have a special meeting to do it, we can consider that too, because I know we want to move this, move this along. Um, is everyone kind of good with where, where we're at? Excellent. Um, any final thoughts or questions? Nathan? Do you, uh, does the board want me to work with Brett and Seiji, who are, and Merrick, who are members of the committee, on that next step in terms of getting some sort of input and feedback or just go off and do my own thing and then come back or work with Jim uh, as I draft things. And, it, and would, it would be good to, I think, bounce some things off people. If we can do it in a way that doesn't require Anna to warrant every communication, that would be um, wonderful. Uh, let's maybe discuss that and see what, what works best. So that we can, okay, let me know. Yeah. Because I think we have a meeting soon, and we've got to discuss where we landed. If we need any sort of structure that needs to be blessed by the board for that, we can do that. But um, yeah, yeah, I think I think getting some input from people who are involved in the process would be would be helpful. And if we can do it in a way that's not um, you know process heavy in terms of of you know warnings and things, and yeah, you know, if we do need to to warn some small meetings, we can do that. Yeah, excellent. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate all the work that you put in and all the work that all the committee members put in. I see there's a couple other committee members in the audience, so everybody who's both here and um, uh, unable to attend. Thank you. And yeah, we look forward to hearing more from the committee members as, the, yeah, as we get to kind of the public presentation stage and, and further processes. So. Great. Thanks, Nathan. Um, so opening conversation on budget process is next. Uh, um, the purpose of this is just to kind of have a short, I think, check-in. We can delve deeper into the next meeting just to get it on people's minds. Um, yeah, a, uh, just kind of a, an overview. I know that we had the uh, budget policy monitoring report at the last meeting, but kind of overview of our rough schedule. Um, you know, kind of we want an ongoing basis, collect community input, um, you know, listen to the superintendent's monitoring data, uh, other information relevant to the budget. I think we've kind of been doing this. I think people are really giving kind of thought to the budget. Um, yeah, I think probably in our next meeting or meet after that, we might want to discuss some, some budget priorities. Uh, that's kind of a late summer, September thing. 
um, formally adopt uh, a budget calendar. Um, and then October and November, I think really kind of dig into a community outreach plan um, and a plan to give feedback and priorities back to the uh, administration. Um, so that way, when they're crafting a budget in for presentation in December, um, you know, they can incorporate that feedback, uh, you know, and then obviously, you know, January and uh, we, you know, present to the public uh, and adopt the budget uh, and then, you know, put, put it forth for presentation. Um, so I just want to remind people of that. Uh, get people thinking, I guess, let's give like 10 minutes for just kind of high level thoughts on kind of thoughts or, present or expectations for the budget process, maybe some things we just want to keep in mind. Uh, and let's do this kind of popcorn style rather than delve into debate just so we can come to the next meeting thinking about about ideas. Um, but I'll, I'll open it up for kind of high level thoughts on, you know, things we should be mindful of as we enter this budget cycle and, and things we might want to uh, you know, delve into more detail as we put together the calendar and think about how much. Mia, looks like your hand is about to go. I had a thought just to um, be mindful of things like Rhett and Amanda mentioned the um, hesitancy of members of the community to give us more input because there's some, some survey fatigue or <laughs> engagement fatigue possibly happening. And we have a lot of data right now from many, many different conversations that have been happening over the course of the year. So the thought that I have is not full, totally fully formed, but what if rather than for the community engagement piece of what we're going to do, rather than asking really open-ended questions, the board actually come up with, hey, here's, here's some thoughts we have based on what we've heard over the course of this last year that we think would be some priorities and then you know, kind of like Nathan does for us, give them something to react to mm -hmm. instead of asking these open-ended questions. Um, because I could I could see how open-ended questions might be overwhelming at this point, yeah. or maybe even frustrating for the people who have come and given us their feedback <laughs> a few times for them to say, I, I feel like I've already said this. <laughs> if you're not, <laughs> and may so maybe we could say, this would be not just a way of demonstrating that we're listening, but also like using the information. So um, that's just one high level thought on the, the how we could do that part of the process. Yeah, no, I think go into community engagement with some ideas. I think that's a fantastic suggestion. I think you know, due to the ESSER process and other processes we have, yeah, you know, we have a lot. We've, we've gotten a lot of feedback, and, and my guess is a lot of those ideas have not changed much in the last you know few months. Great, great suggestion. Uh, others. Emma? Um, yeah, I love this idea, Mia. And I wonder if, um, you know, usually I'm the part of the budget process that I'm, um, that I think is maybe the most important. It feels like when Libby meets with her admin team and they talk about like sort of building priorities. And I, I'm just wondering how to sort of like time and capture that moment with like, do we, Right. Do we take some of the, the brainstorms from that session to the community for input, or do we take community input and provide it for those sessions? I don't know what the best way to do it is, but I just feel like that moment in time when you're meeting with your admin team, you're going over building priorities. Um, you know, how do we make the most of that part of the process? Yeah, I would just put out there that like that doesn't happen in a vacuum. You know, like we don't ignore Obviously. it things we ignore yeah. and things like that. So right. um, we when we have those conversations and those priorities, like if things are taken, things we've heard are always taken into consideration. I'm just wondering, so would it be more helpful for us to try to like provide community feedback prior to that or take your highest level sort of priorities? From that, and then get feedback from the community. Good question. You know, what my without without talking to my team, feel free to jump in, team. <laughs> Part of team. <laughs> um, I would say that it would be helpful for us to have themes to work within during that conversation. And roughly, when does that happen? 
when you do that, Mike? You do that usually end of October, like mid October. Yeah. Yeah. So we gotta get going. The very first one. Remember, the very first one is literally throwing up everything we can think of on the right. board, which is just everything, right? Yeah. It's just pie in the sky. Right. And then um, we come back to it. So, like, okay. if the very first one is October ish, right? We only we meet twice a month around the stuff, although sometimes we have other budgeting meetings we add into the calendar, but it's like, but it's October, early November. So, so when is input too late to shape that? Like, like Thanksgiving time, yeah. Right. So probably the second yeah. the second board meeting in November, like we're, that it's pretty well getting cooked by then. Yeah. Okay. So I think the board comes out with a theme for October, right? Like, or at least by yeah, October. October. Yeah, I I oh, sorry. I, I think that like board gives the themes from all the feedback we've gotten, including from the vision committee. I think there's a lot of things in there. And then we give to the administration of the first round in October. And then when do we get the community feedback? Do we get the community feedback from the themes that we create? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Okay. We share, we we come up with like this is what this is what we're here, like the big stuff that we're hearing that should be priorities in this budget. What do you think about that? That's the thing that they would react to, and then that's then we can hand that to the administration. I think that always the challenge for me has been like the parts that we already do that are already in the budget. Right? These parts are already kind of taken care of. Like how do we give that feedback back? You know, like, I don't want to go back to say, we need more social emotional learning when we already have like, these are, instead of saying here, we have three positions, this is what we're doing and what, you know, mm. you know what I mean? Like, it's, yeah, what's uh, already in there? It, yeah. yeah. And there's a lot that's been, I mean, there, a lot of the community feedback that we've been hearing has already sort of been addressed and included in the budget. For this year. Right. Yeah. And, and. I went to a middle school parents meeting the other night, last night, and it was clear that people did not did not know a lot of that stuff had not been sort of amplified and um, I don't know. Um, we had a bit. It, it's clear that the community at Mainstream Middle School didn't really understand some of the stuff that we had been putting money towards. And they were excited to hear about it. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I like this point. Like, I don't know how we sort of go through some of the priorities that we've already been addressing in this current budget. I think and though I if they have the to, themes we can yeah. we can say these, you know, in the in our in our presentation, the long presentations that we do for you all, right? The longer mm -hmm. ones we can have slides of, you know, here's a theme that we have heard will stick with social emotional learning. Right. These are the things that we've we've funded because we're talking about financials, right? That we funded and are in process. Um, here's our human resources, here's our programmatic decisions, here's these things, here's maybe what we're adding. Yeah. Right? Like then yeah. there's the there's the piece or not. Or yeah. Not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or just maintaining. Yeah. Right. Or just right. maintaining. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I I think that if we get that feedback and then you know people can say, well, you still miss this part that I said, you know, like there's always that. But yeah. I think Instead of asking, here's the budget, like we're building on this work. Yeah. You know, we're building, we're not every year starting from scratch. We're saying, here's things we're listening, here's how that got input, and this, ha this is an ongoing thing instead of being the one year. So, yeah, new. You know? yeah. Well, I think to build on Amada's point, I mean, I, and I think, I, mean, I think part of our job is not just to get feedback from the Community, but also to educate the community right. on what's being done and how priorities are being addressed. And um, yeah, I think get feedback on that education. But I think, you know, when we go to the community, we can go with, with more than just questions. We can also go with an explanation of here are investments that are being made and here are, you know, priorities we've heard in the past that are being built on and, um, you know, get reactions to those, but also, you know, educate folks so they can be like, oh, they, they've, they've been yeah. listening. 
uh, the marketing idea. <laughs> Great. Obviously, feedback is always hard to get, and sometimes it's it's reactionary. It's after all the meetings have happened, they see the big number for the track, and they're like, hey, what's going on? I wish I was involved when you know, there's plenty of chances to be involved. Um, I don't know if it's appropriate or not, but I think a good way to get people's attention would be to put an article on the bridge. And the title would say, you know, district is buying Libya Mercedes. <laughs> the first sentence could be like, no, we're not. Put but, my name in the well, title. You know, so, yeah. so, <laughs> something, you know. So, and it, it could just be the, the title. The first sentence could be like, no, this is just a joke to get your attention, but budget meetings are coming up. Something like that, because then, if, you know, people would talk about it being, you know, front porch forum. You know, oh, about the uh, high school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That was the reason. Just going to put that out there again. <laughs> oh, we can say, yo, my third high school will be renamed Seiji Hashi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great to me. That's a great <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> but I mean, something, I mean, you know, like, or we can do like shock TikTok people, shock people before like, they, they see the yeah. numbers. I mean, the, I, I, if, if the board got together and did one of those TikTok <laughs> trend videos, like, you know, the kids would pay attention and be like, hey, budget meeting. <laughs> Halfway there. We'll put Mike Berry on it. I think I think Merrick's in charge of the TikTok. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> you, can, you can turn a board meeting into a compelling TikTok video. Right there. I'm not sure where I stand on the stunt part of that proposal, <laughs> but I definitely think you know putting once we get to the point we have like some sort of um, instrument to collect. Yeah feedback or a date where we're asking for feedback and then just advertising that pretty widely. So just in terms of timeline, we have the themes, then we say, here's how these themes are being taken care of in this year's budget that we plan to maintain or, and then that goes back or like, I'm just thinking of steps. If we have, is of August 24th, we have until mid-October, we're kind of putting more work to the administration in terms of set before their meeting. So I just want to yeah. make sure that either that or we do it after just to be more conscientious. Of I think in the next meeting we should get a good calendar set down and Libby and I can, can talk about this between now and what's the next meeting, September 7th? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and really map that out, but I, I think we need we need a good calendar by then of you know when when we expect the themes to come out when we need to get feedback from uh, when we need to get feedback give feedback to the, the administration you know when we need to go out to the community um, and and really kind of map that out and I think I think we can do that the seventh. I think we could probably do some retreat time for I mean we could do that like yeah. board priorities. Yep. can also be sort yeah. of drive themes. I think those are similar. I don't know. They should they should be related. We wouldn't want to have yes. priorities that yeah. we're also not funding. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. No, yeah. That's too much work. Right. So I feel like it will our work at the retreat hopefully we can help yeah. identify those things. We just need to make the retreat happen. Yes. It looks like looks like we're closing out a day. I, I also just wanted to say I think they're because Amanda, you mentioned putting some more work on the administration. I think this also will require a bit of homework on the part of board members for us to do another review of all of the different places where we've received feedback and do our own thinking on what's rising to the top that we would say we should name as budget priorities. Mm -hmm. Or just budget items. <laughs> Other uh, um, I'm not, I don't know if I should know, but I'm not sure when the weighting change occurs, when it goes into effect, or what the range of change might, that we might expect is. And I hope, I don't know, but I hope that some range and some estimate of what's possible is somewhere in either the long presentation or I don't know where that fits, but we may not be friend. thinking about. Yeah. I'm th I'm thinking about where we're no longer able to add, but where we may need to to yeah. to pull back a little bit. And and if that's next year, next year's budget or the following year's budget, I don't know if I'll, I hope I'll still be here, but I want to be thinking about that. We will be looking to reallocate this year. Like the the way study will come into effect this year. I don't know how it's it will be eased in across three different years, 
but each of those years we will need to increase our tax capacity in order to because of the waiting study um, and we'll have to think about how do we reallocate funds for our priorities during each of those time periods um, so unfortunately the agency of education person who's in charge of this is retiring december 30th <laughs> which is exactly when we don't need him to retire because he understands the waiting formula better than anybody. Um, so when superintendents were raising this concern with the secretary last Thursday, he, we were told not to worry about it and that it was on their radar. So we don't, we don't know. We haven't been told any information yet. Um, but it, as soon as I know, I will ensure that you all know at the same time. <laughs> Once I wait, once Christina and I understand it, um, but there's some there's some uh, perfect storms that are all happening at the same time around this particular budget season. Mm -hmm. Because you're right, we will need to reallocate funding based on enrollment and based on the new aid funds. Anything else? Otherwise, we can go to. Executive session. Yeah, policy policy monitor. Monitor. Oh, policy monitor. Sorry. Um, thank, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you for being here. Yeah, thank oh, you. Before, since we have like one minute, Peggy Sue and Joss and Jason, come here. Uh, <laughs> so, board members, this is Peggy Sue Van Ostrand. She is our Hello. director of student services. Nice to meet you all. She is already making gigantic, wonderful waves in our world of special education and is worth her weight in gold. Th then this is Jess Murray. So Jess is our new director of social emotional learning and wellness. And speaking of reallocation, this is one area where I know I will be looking to prioritize to get this position out of grant funding and into local funding because Jess is just amazing and uh, we so need this role in our administrative services. And then Jason Gingold, you've met Jason before, I think. Um, online, I think maybe, but yes. Jason is the uh, newest principal at MHS and is super excited to welcome kids back tomorrow. That's for day one tomorrow. Hooray. Hooray. He's, they have all made it through their first in service you, with MRPS. Do you have a, another bow tie for tomorrow? Absolutely. Yes. Is, I it, that is it new? Time. Are you sure. repeating from last week? <laughs> oh, no, I'm not repeating from last week. Yeah. I was just curious. It's like define new. New to you. <laughs> that's, that's what we're looking for. May you all sleep well. Yeah. I really yeah. appreciate your um, your 30, 30 second interview things. It's been nice right. to just quickly kind of drop in on who thinks garden gnomes are creepy and whatnot. <laughs> Which is a conversation we're going to revisit because I like my garden gnomes. <laughs> All right, thank you to you three. Yeah, good night. Good night. Policy monitoring. Um, do you have a motion to approve the monitoring report on student attendance? <clears throat> Talking about attendance and people coming back to school. I move to approve the policy monitoring report on student attendance. Do you have a second? Okay. Any discussion? Um, so this policy, was this why like the past year or so there was no enforcement for student attendance really or? There's enforcement for it. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean like last year there wasn't a lot of enforcement when it came to people who were late to school, for example. Like, I don't think there was in years past there used to be, but last year there, there wasn't from what I saw. There was, you may not have seen it. Okay. There may have been a bit more leniency because of pandemic conditions. Okay. Um, however, you may just not have seen the, the enforcement in some areas. Okay. And you're talking about specifically tardiness, not... Yeah, like tardiness day. specifically. It's like when it came to tardiness, there wasn't really any um, punishments, I, I would say. I don't know. I lost out in middle school. There were. Okay. Like, okay. At least at the high school. Very I'm, clear in their communication about... Well, yeah. This is not an optional arrival time. And I think that was a good move. But so that is that is related to the policy though. Yeah, if you look in the um the it should be linked in the policy with the truancy procedures. Yeah. And the procedures, truancy is part of that. Okay. Which is unexcused absence and late absences. And a certain number of late absences equals one full day of 
absenteeism. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's three in Bible school. Really? Yeah. I think it's five here. Yeah. Five is jumping out of my brain, but I could be wrong on that. Yeah. I, I, I never experienced. <laughs> Jim. Uh. Um, I now remember um, former principal Mike McCrae got in front of this board and, and one of the statements was that this community does not value timeliness. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's says, the, for says a while. the man who's perennially five minutes late to every meeting. Mike? You! No, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I reflect the values of my constituents. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, that's something that I need to work on. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> um, let's move into executive session. We have it. Oh, we haven't voted. Okay. Yeah. Um, any further discussion? All in favor. Aye. Uh, Opposed? Great. Now we can move into executive session. Do I have a motion to go into executive session for um, the purpose of superintendent evaluation? First round. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Great.